And I'm Nicholas. And I am Malik. I tried to host this on my channel, but that was a colossal failure. So. <laughs> well, um, hopefully, by the time we get this done, I'll have walked you through how to post it on your channel, and then it will be on your channel. Yeah. But uh, for now, we're talking about Spider-Man Homecoming, our hopes and predictions for that movie, um, and what we think of the trailers, promo material, um, the actors, cast, uh, all that <laughs> stuff. Three separate videos. We're doing that for uh, Homecoming, and then Ragnarok, and then Black Panther. But first, Homecoming, since that's like half a month away. I it it. Can I just say how weird it feels that this movie is so close? Because yeah, of like all the advertising, like it gets, it has more ads than movies that are further out. But it's it still feels like. It's it's weird that it's a few days away technically. Mm -hmm. it, it is very surreal. I remember when we got that first trailer and being just so excited about it. Honestly, this whole like Spider-Man just being in the MCU has just been really really exciting. Yeah. Although I guess the first thing I want to talk about in regards to I feel like a lot of this is going to be talking about the ads and how they've just been handling the ad campaign. I know some people have a problem with the amount of focus the ads are putting on, it's Spider-Man in the MCU now. <laughs> like you have the advertisement, that's, uh, you have the trailer that's all about find your place in the universe. Most of the posters feature Avengers Tower in some way. And a lot of people are like, that's going overboard, that's too much like it's in the avengers universe and not enough see it because it's a good movie and on the one hand i agree with that but on the other hand not really reflective of the movie i don't think it's a problem it's just sony trying to make sure that people know that this is a joint effort and so they get more money yeah i think it's just an advertisement gimmick well um putting my two cents in on that i think um i think it's a little more than an advertising gimmick given just how much of iron man we've seen in the trailers i think um he has a pretty substantial role in this movie i don't agree with people calling it iron man 4 like yeah. i think that's that's really but, silly but to those, that you haven't seen the movie yet mm -hmm. to those but, people um, ever Avengers Age of Ultron, Iron Man 4. Civil War, Iron Man 4. After this movie comes out and Infinity War starts showing trailers that feature Tony prominently, Infinity War is going to be Iron Man 4. Pretty much if Iron Man just makes a cameo, it's an Iron Man movie at this point for those people. <laughs> well, I mean, to be fair, he hasn't made any small cameos. He's always played a substantial role in the movies that he's appeared in. Like, He's a main character in Age of Ultron. He's a main character in Civil War. I hope he's not a main character in this movie. It feels like that's possible, but I hope he's of a major supporting role. Well, I think I think they're approaching it as him being the mentor character, like how um, in Supergirl season two yeah. we had. Um, Superman show up, but it, Superman didn't show up, and it was suddenly the show was all about him. He was yeah. simply um, Kara's mentor and something for her to look at and strive towards. And then surpass come the season. Yeah. Finale. And so I'm thinking, I, I don't know, I'm ballparking it at about like 15 minutes total screen time for Stark. Yeah, I, I don't see him being in more than at max 20 minutes of this movie. But I think he, he has a fairly substantial role. It's more than a cameo, but, you know, you're not, he's not necessarily a main character. Yeah. I mean, like, like 15-ish minutes of scenes that he is in, not 15 minutes worth of time that he is literally on the screen on camera. Like, I've seen... Uh, videos where people take the amount of screen time the characters have, and it's literally the amount of seconds that they're on camera. I think 
Tony's going to be like less than 20% of this movie on the screen. Probably, hopefully, I don't know. I think the reason why he's in the advertisement so much is because he's popular and people want to see more Iron Man. So this is good for marketing. But I, don't I mean, see one, him. I don't see him being like in most of the movie, though. Yeah, but that's that's the whole thing with this whole ad campaign is one Iron Man is popular, two the Avengers and the MCU as a whole is popular, so they want to constantly remind people of that, and three people have not liked the last three movies in this franchise that Sony has attempted. I personally don't mind Spider-Man 3 or either of the Amazing Spider-Man films. They all have big problems. Their problems are only as big as the first two movies, I think. And But for the most part, general consensus has been that it's been... 15, no, 13 years since the last good Spider-Man movie by Sony, so they really want to build up audience confidence. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think the way to do that is necessarily by throwing as much Iron Man as they can into the movie, but um, since since Marvel is handling this creatively, I think that's, at least for me as a, as a fan, that's enough for me to um, be less less skeptical about it. Yeah, same. Yeah. Because this is this is Marvel handling their character. But yeah. then there are people who don't like know as much about the situation as we do, and assume that because Sony's name on it, name is on it, that they're in charge. And so this is them trying to reel in those people who might not trust Sony, but who trust just the universe that Marvel's built. And also that um that uh that um <laughs> you have um a lot of people you know may not have seen well there are there's a fair amount of people that haven't seen Civil War. Um and so they they're they're not gonna know that Spider Man's been introduced. I mean, with the, everyone that's been talking about it, it's I don't see how you wouldn't know that in mm. some way before this movie comes out. But um, I guess I feel, like for I those feel, people, I feel like every, I feel, I feel like everyone has seen Civil War. Who's going to care about that? Yeah, more than likely. Yeah. More than likely. And uh, hmm, I guess since we're still on the subject of Tony, like my only other thing to talk about with him was, do we think that he's going to have like an arc in this movie? Because I think that a lot of. I'm oh, sorry. Continue. And I was just gonna say that a lot of he's he's pretty much every movie that featured him has had him in a different place at the end than he is at the beginning. I think he and Peter are going to come to an understanding over the course of this movie, but he's not necessarily. Like I feel like. Tony at the end of Homecoming is going to be in roughly the same place character-wise as Tony at the end of Civil War. I think that would make sense. And I wouldn't want it the other way around. I wouldn't want him having an actual character arc in this movie because then it does validate that thing of this is partially an Iron Man movie. Yeah. I think the yeah. focus is going to be on Peter personally. Yeah. It's, it's fine if major characters have an arc like I wouldn't complain if Ned Leeds had an arc or Flash Thompson had an arc. I think Tony's going to change somehow, but I think it's only going to be relative to Peter. Probably. Which justifies Peter still being the main character. But I don't mm -hmm. think I don't think like Iron Man's outlook on life or anything is gonna change as a result of this movie. With Peter that might happen. It's probably gonna happen. Yeah. I don't see that either. Uh, I'd like to talk to you guys about uh, the cast. We have, of course, Tom Holland in the role of Spider-Man. We have um, uh, a whole new uh, cast of uh, teens, the high schoolers in the movie. We have Liz Allen. We have um, uh, Zendaya playing a character that's just for the movie. We have um, <coughs> Michael Keaton playing the vulture. 
uh, my, what do you guys think uh, of the cast? Uh, just in terms of the actors they chose, like, I only know Michael Keaton. I've seen Zandaya in that, um, that, uh, that Disney Channel movie. Uh, what was it? That remote that let her control men? Yeah, I think it was a movie about, like, a remote that just controlled all of the males in her life. I don't really, I don't remember that movie well enough to judge her acting performance. But, uh, I, I don't know, I, I, from what little we have of her, she seems like she's doing a good job. I'm interested in what the deal with that character is. Like, uh, it started with people assuming that she was Mary Jane. And then when it came out that the character's name was Michelle, they're like, she's secretly Mary Jane. There's going to be a twist where she turns out to have been Mary Jane or something. Sorts of theories like she's Michelle Toon, she's the Vulture's daughter, she's gonna be White Tiger at some point, she's uh, this other character, I don't know. Everyone is assuming that she's going to be, like, secretly a comic character, which, I mean, there's that in this universe, but I'd I think it's more likely and will probably be original character who's got a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. Uh, I just hope she doesn't become just a generic love interest and that's it. <laughs> I don't think she's going to be a love interest at all because Peter has his love interest for this movie and that's Liz Allen. And I know that Peter, Peter Parker's whole thing is... Um, what is it that they said in like their their uh, character notes for Spectacular Spider-Man? Uh, Peter truly and genuinely falls completely in love with any girl that he happens to be talking to. So it's not out of character that they would do a love triangle thing, but mm -hmm. I think it'd be more interesting and it seems more likely to be like what they're going to do, that she's just a girl who hangs around him and they don't necessarily get romantically involved at all. And I think it's really telling that Zendaya is on the poster for for Homecoming, but Peter's um, love interest is not. Like I think that Zendaya is playing a character who, while while Peter is not infatuated with her and isn't going after her romantically, um, their relationship is more. Um, integral to Peter's arc in his, in his story. And if not, at the very least, she's going to be like the source of plot points. Well, we see in the trailer her, her question him, like when he goes to leave somewhere, she's like, where are you going, Peter? Like her slowly pick up on, on the fact that he, he's constantly leaving school to probably go off and fight crime and, and super villains. Yeah, but then at the same time, that ends with, no, nah, I'm just kidding. I don't care. Go wherever you want. Which I like. <laughs> I like how it's sort of setting it up like, oh, maybe she knows that he's Spider-Man. And even if she does, she doesn't care. She's just like, yeah, you're not my problem. But then again, part of me also wants to assume that they put her on the poster because, again, she's been in Disney stuff. She has a built-in fan base already. Like, putting Zendaya on your poster gets you like a young teen girl audience that you might not get otherwise for this type of movie? Probably. Part of me wants yeah. to, part of me thinks that's why they hired her. Yeah, maybe. It has kind of a teeny feel to it, the movie. Uh, almost. I mean, like, did you know I want to say? I don't want to say that, but it does have a little bit of that feel to it. So, they might be trying to appeal to a, a younger audience here. Which, as far as I'm concerned, is a good thing, since that's a unique sort of vibe for these movies. Like, the more and more of these movies that we make, you want each one to feel like its own thing. Mm -hmm. So if making it sort of like a teen, like, sort of skewed younger, more relating to the teen's comedy is what's going to, like a, like a, they said they were taking influence from Breakfast Club and stuff like that and the Rat Pack. If that sort of thing is what it takes for this movie to stand out as the 16th? The 16th of these movies, then yeah. 
Um, I, I would. I wouldn't go as far as calling it a Disney Channel looking movie, just because yeah, they have look like one of those. one actress who's been in Disney related properties. But yeah, I mean, it I does just have. Mean, that. That's where my brain goes when I think like teen stuff set in high school. It's but not, see not like okay, like okay, that extreme, but it's just a good like, Disney Channel. You you know what you're talking about. You're more teen stuff. Yeah, there's like the CW teen high school stuff that's like like sort of skewed toward a more mature audience, and they'll talk about mature subject. Matter. And then there's the Disney teen stuff where it's just like. Kids in high school having shenanigans, and that's what this feels a bit more like. I do think it's um a little unfortunate. Like I've talked to some uh, some friends of mine who um who are also big into comics and uh, and these and these type of movies, and you know we'll talk about this movie. You know, Spider Man Homecoming comes up, and it's like I don't like uh I don't like how teeny they're going. I don't like the whole teen thing. I'm an adult. I can't relate to that. And I just, I mean, I don't think any of us are in high school anymore, and that stuff is still very much relatable because, like, it's happened. Like, we've all been at high school at some point. Now, you have to be in high school to appreciate a movie that's set in high school, much in the same way none of us were around in the time period that Wonder Woman was taking place, but we all came to that movie really enjoying it. Yeah, you don't have something to latch on to. You so I just don't see have to that kind of oversimplified complaint. Yeah, I just feel like I think I think people feel like you have to be able to relate to a character's circumstances if you want to relate to them, and that that's been proven multiple times to not be true. Like no one who likes that most of the people who like Doctor Strange aren't neurosurgeons. Most of the people who like the Iron Man movies aren't billionaire genius inventors. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I don't know where that complaint has come from, but it seems to be around since the dawn of time. But really, if it's a good movie or TV show, it shouldn't matter if it's teenagers or adults or what time period. Mm. But, I mean, I guess I see a lot of, like, everyday or, like, geek characters People seem to relate to a lot. Yeah. People that, kind of put them on pedestal a lot of times because they're relatable. And I guess they look at like high school stuff as the same way. Oh, it's not relatable to me anymore. But I just don't find, I never understood that. I mean, you can have people in like things, uh, shows that have nothing to do with your life and still find them entertaining. Yeah, like. One of my favorite shows, and that I still think really holds up, is Ned's Declassified School Survival Guide. And not only is that set in middle school, it's set in, like, the bizarro cartoon world can't possibly exist version of middle school. (laughs) And, uh, I guess outside of Zendaya, the only other uh, cast member besides uh, Tom and Robert Downey Jr. that's of note is... um, is uh, Michael Keaton. And uh, I honestly, I want to know if someone at Marvel, if Kevin Feige or whoever, like, heard people talking about Michael Keaton as Vulture just because of Birdman and thought it would be funny. Like, is that the only reason they hired him because of Birdman? Well, I think that that's certainly a factor. Um, but it is, I find it both ironic and hilarious. This will be the third time in a row that he's played a character related to flying. We got Batman, Birdman, and now the Vulture. Although it's not exactly in a row since there was like a long stretch between Batman and Birdman, but no, there, there is a long stretch. But but you know what I mean, like yeah, three different flying related characters. Like his, like his biggest roles, pretty much. Next role, he'll just be Chicken Man. <laughs> yeah. And, It'll be the sequel to Birdman about how he can't believe he got himself roped back into these comic book movies. <laughs> but but also he's just a he's a powerhouse um, actor. Mm-hmm. Um, he's not the kind of actor. I mean, 
hardly any act there is anymore because just the climate of Hollywood has changed so much. Um, but hardly any actor by himself brings in box office. Yeah. It's all about, you know, the movie, how you market it and, you know, just how the public reacts to it. But um, he is like a very um, revered and respected actor. And so yeah. I think getting someone of his stature in the role and reinventing the character just makes the vulture all around a more compelling villain. At the very least, it gives people like hope, reason to hope that he's going to be more compelling, even if they don't necessarily uh, like the Marvel villains. I've gone on record a couple times saying that I I don't agree with people in their like perception of the MCU villains. I don't think that they're that bad on the whole. I especially don't think that they're like noteworthy bad in comparison to other villains in Hollywood just at the moment. Like, what's the last really good movie period you saw that had a real memorable villain? But that, that's... Um, you don't have to answer that. That's just something to think about, and yet people always cite the Marvel movies as no, they have the bad villains. DC's villains have been mostly mediocre. Uh, friggin' yeah, any they really movie have I could like to stand on with that. Outside of the Nolan movies, they really have no leg to stand on in terms of villains it's, either. James Bond, just because I've been thinking about James Bond recently, they managed to mess up Blofeld. A lot of movies don't have great villains, you guys. But I think for the most part, the MCU has managed to have some good ones, and they've been getting really good with being consistent lately with just how decent they've managed to be. Ultron is my favorite. Uh, Civil War gave me Mo, who I liked a lot. Elias a lot in Doctor Strange. I like Ego in um, Guardians. So I'm hoping that uh, Vulture keeps up with that trend, but I don't know. I feel like with the way this movie is set up, we might not be able to devote a lot of time to him. Especially Probably not. Especially since we've also got two versions of the Shocker. The Tinkerer is in there. Whoever Donald Glover is playing that I think is going to be a substantial role. So I think odds are that a lot of screen time is going to be shared with them and that uh, Vulture isn't going to get a lot of time to leave an impression. Uh, my prediction, I think on the whole, people are going to say that he's passable. Yeah. Yeah. And then they'll use that as a way to badmouth the villains again. <laughs> yeah. To talk about the more super superficial stuff for a second, um, how do you guys feel about the costumes? I think Vulture's costume looks awesome. My favorite Spider-Man costume um, that we've gotten in live action so far is still the one from the Amazing Spider-Man 2. Mm -hmm. But I, I do love um, Spider-Man's costume that they have him wearing in this in Marvel's generation. The Amazing Spider-Man 2 costume is the costume that, like, even before that movie came out, I think it's the one that everyone thinks of when they think Spider-Man. Yeah. Like, you don't exactly think the Raimi costume. You don't think the Amazing 1 costume. That costume... And Amazing 2 was, like, as iconic as possible. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, just to my personal tastes, I like this costume more. I like the bits of black that, like, separate the arms and the shoulders and stuff. Those are really cool. The expressive eyes, of course, just the expressive eyes instantly make this the best one. I think that is, like, the way they have it, like, a camera... With the way they move, I thought that was a perfect way to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It definitely has a more cartoony look to it, though. Uh, but, I mean, that is just, well, hmm. I, I think, because people say that, are you talking about, like, the way it looks CGI? Kind of. It looks very smooth, like it's a... Uh, yeah. He looks, like, he looks like an effect, mm -hmm. even though I, we know that that's Tom Holland doing stunts in costume they like enhanced it or something he looks real smooth and shiny kind of but i don't have a problem with it uh, i mean i like uh, amazing spider-man one the best if i had to pick out all of them but I don't know, i've got to see it throughout the whole movie to really make my decision on it the first amazing spider-man one you're talking about yeah hmm I like that one. It fits with the tone of that movie. 
but it's not what I would want Spider-Man wearing in these movies. Yeah, it, it also goes with the theme, like we were talking about, it's more high school and kitty. And, car- well, I guess the cartoony look kind of works with it as it's well. Okay, Eden has a point to make. Kylo Ren is a memorable, if two-dimensional villain. Eden, get out of here! It's a nasty talk about Kylo Ren. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> I don't past, even like Kylo Ren that We're much. past the villain Wait! Also, I think this is the best costume, not including the Venom 1 from Spider-Man 3. Okay, bye guys. Have a good night. We can't see Eden. We can't see anybody. It's for the best. You can't see anyone. Yes. Well, I can't see uh, you or Eden. <laughs> well, I'm on the screen right now, so... As long as it's recording, that's good. Okay. Anyway, we got <laughs> caught up talking about costumes. Uh, I guess the only other one to talk about is this movie's uh, Iron Man armor, which I gotta admit I'm not a big fan of. Oh, uh, well, they, they took it straight out of the Ultimate Comics. Yeah, I I saw the the issue that that's uh, taken from. I don't know. It just it feels weird to have black or at least such like dark. That's a gray. Dark gray on an Iron Man armor. Like I'm more used to it being either like I, I'm 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 too used to the combinations of silver, gold, or red or some variation on those colors. I think it's nice to have have it there just as like a, a link to the fans who've who've read the Ultimate Comics. Mm. Um, it doesn't bother me too much since Iron Man's role in the movie isn't that big. Yeah, I'm thinking at most we get two action scenes with him in it. Probably. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. It's got a lot of silver in it. I, I don't know. It, just the way it looks in like uh, promotional art and stuff, it always looks dark black or dark gray. Mm-hmm. Like bordering on black, mm-hmm. it throws me off a bit. I mean, I'm looking at the other suits. Uh, um, like- I think that we've, in regards to, um, in regards to Spider-Man suit, with it looking, you know, CGI in certain shots, um, even shots where you know we know it's Tom Holland in the suit, but the costume itself looks like it's just been painted onto him CGI. I think that is the one drawback and like i think that that m- might be a pretty significant complaint from people mm. coming out of the movie is you know spider-man just looked cgi the whole time which for me i feel like we've gotten way out of control with complaining about cgi yes <laughs> yeah i mean it that really was. when i when i saw two separate reviews of uh alien covenant one of which was like the CG in this movie is the worst, most obvious CG I've seen in a long time. And the other one, which was like, this is probably the closest to looking real that any CG has ever come in anything. And so at this point, I'm like, either you see it or you don't. It's different to everyone's eyes. Complaining about the fidelity in CG at at this point in Hollywood is... I don't know, unless it's really glaringly bad, it feels like a waste of time. It does. Yes. There, there are things of note where it's you look at it and it's just it's so bad you can't help but mention it. Like um, just this year alone, we had uh, Resident Evil, the final chapter, and Underworld Blood Wars. Those are two examples of god awful CG. It's so glaringly noticeable mm. that it rips you right out of the movie. Also, but, again, and to be fair, we are only seeing a little of it. The CG on the Vulture looks great. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. That looks awesome. The propellers, everything. I, I like the uh, I like the wing that, like, gets caught in the web and goes, like, snap like a hand. <laughs> like, is he going to be able to use his wings like giant hands? That'd be cool. That would be really cool. I, um, I just want to mention this. I haven't seen people go on rants about, like, bad CGI in a movie or television show, and then I had to tell them that was a practical effect. <laughs> That's happened a couple times, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, the hatred for CGI is just, like, blind, and it's just constant and annoying. It really is. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, hmm. Something I'm wondering 
is like, since we're talking about screen time, this movie does have to juggle a lot. It has to juggle Tony and Peter's relationship. It has to juggle the vulture. It has to juggle the high school stuff. How much of the movie, like percentage-wise, do you think is going to be either set in the school or with involving Peter's school mates? If, if, you're, if you're talking strictly school scenes, like all the high school stuff, mm-hmm. I, I honestly think that will be, at the very, la- at the very least, 60% of the movie. 60 or 70% of the movie. Yeah. Because with all the comparisons to... um. To Breakfast, Breakfast Club. Club. Unless they're being facetious, yeah, facetious, which for as much as I trust this studio is entirely possible, unless they're being facetious, it it's it's kind of hard to imagine how you get that vibe if most of the movie isn't in the school setting or at least involves Peter hanging out with people his own age. Yeah, I think that will be the, the bulk of the movie. Is all the high school stuff. Yeah. And that, that, that's the stuff they seem most excited about doing. Like when you when you see Kevin Feige and uh, the director John Watts talk about this movie and um, behind the scenes, they're um, they're like, "This isn't. We're not just making another Spider Man movie. We're making a Peter Parker movie." Mm-hmm. And then they be reiterated that multiple mm-hmm. times. So mm-hmm. they they're more excited to do the high school stuff. Mm-hmm. Um than the Spider-Man stuff because they know that we've gotten great Spider-Man action and stuff. And they, it looks like they're going to deliver on that side for sure. Yeah. But their, their main focus this time around is getting that Peter Parker aspect that they don't feel like we've, we've really gotten with the other movies, which is, is fair to a degree. And to, it does, it is interesting to wonder then how much action is this movie going to have? Because uh, Guardians Volume 2 just came out, and I think of that movie as not having a lot of action, as being mostly downtime. But then if you really, like, count the action scenes in that movie, there's at least five of them. Maybe, yeah. But maybe six they're, they're, um, throughout the movie. Kind of sporadically paced throughout the first half of the movie. Uh, yeah, most of the, the, the... It's just... Like, counting the action scenes, like, beginning to end of a fight, there's, like, five or six action scenes, and yet I think of that as one of the least action-y movies in this universe. Oh, yeah, because it's, that movie's, I feel like it's more of a comedy than an action film. I feel like it's more of a character study. Well, character study, that too, yeah. Like, all of these movies have comedy, and Guardians, the Guardians movies absolutely have the most comedy, but that movie is a lot of character drama and just characters sitting down having conversations. And I wonder how much of Spider-Man is going to be that. How much of it is going to be fights versus characters sitting down talking? I don't think it'll be anything relatively different to what we've seen with most of Marvel's movies. But I do picture them focusing, focusing pretty heavily on the drama and the high school stuff and the relationship stuff. Yeah. Um, with the action, I think we'll get three solid action scenes. I mean, you know, we got the um, the Staten Island Ferry scene with Iron Man. We know that's going to be a pretty big set piece. Yeah, I'm thinking, because it doesn't just have to be big set pieces. So from the trailers, it looks like we've got the, uh, the thing with Staten Island in the boat. We've got uh, him fighting the criminals who are in the Avengers masks. We have um, the climax, of course, which I think is the plane thing. That, yeah, that's more than likely the plane thing. And also, like, fighting Vulture in his base. I'm thinking that that's all part of the climax, or at least part of the same fight, if nothing else. Yeah. And uh, so that's three. I wonder... Oh, yeah, and um, the, uh, the thing in Washington. Yeah, the Washington Monument. So based on the trailers, it looks like we have at least four separate action scenes. So I'm one. So it'll be interesting to see how those are like woven into the story. How long is the movie? Uh, if I remember correctly, they listed the uh, the running time is about two hours seventeen minutes. 
Yeah, it's almost two and a half hours. So I don't think she failed to. And that's credit included, to be fair. Oh, oh okay. So I... two about probably. Okay. Yeah, I think she failed to pull it off. <laughs> I think. Uh, anything else? I mean. Uh, on a similar note to the high school thing. How much of a role, if any, do you think Aunt May is going to play this time around? Well, it's interesting because out of all the stuff they've chosen to show us, we've gotten very little of Aunt May. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like um, they might—that might be the one thing they're saving for the movie. Maybe they, maybe they have some really genuinely emotional, heart-wrenching scenes. Yeah, it mm -hmm. sort of makes me think that, like Michelle or whatever, like we're getting so little of them. That I'm wondering if whatever the trailers haven't... I'm wondering if all of the character stuff is just what the trailers haven't been showing us because they want to get butts in seats and so they cut the trailers for, like, sizzle and stuff. Yeah. Give us the action, throw some humor in there. And that's I'm mostly what they're that, selling the movie on. I'm yeah. thinking that we've seen most of the action, but we haven't seen even a little bit of what the character relationship stuff is. No. Kind of the reverse of what they did with the Power Rangers movie this year. They sold that movie pretty much on um, well, the the Bob they, they got us was like Breakfast Club meets Chronicle. At yeah. The same time, though, it felt well, at least just watching the trailers and not having seen the movie, mm -hmm. it felt like we were going to get um, like they, they'd handled the origin in about um, 20 minutes maybe and then we'd get action for the rest of the movie that that, that entire movie is pretty much origin we don't even get them in suits until the end yeah and, those trailers were very reflective of that movie in that it's it sold you on a little bit on action and of course the name power rangers but mostly on character dynamics and the team relationship which worked way better than i was expecting it to I haven't seen it yet. So. This movie seems to be taking the opposite track, probably. Yeah, they're they're doing the flip of that. At least as far as the ads are concerned. Yeah. Yeah, just just the the way they're marketing it. Yeah. And, um, I don't. I I think they've marketed it pretty well. A lot of people are saying that we've seen too much. I think we've seen too much of the action. Mm -hmm. Um, I think particularly with the Staten Island Ferry scene, that's probably a scene that won't impress people as much as it would would have otherwise we hadn't seen as much of that scene i think the first trailer when they just show spider-man holding it up mm -hmm. i'm like that's perfect that's all we need to see of that scene we didn't even need to know that iron man had anything to do with that scene yeah i feel like iron man being involved in that scene in the trailer is what makes people say that they've seen too much because that is the one big character thing that's in the trailer is I'm nothing without this suit. If you shouldn't, if you if you're nothing without the suit, you don't deserve it. That is maybe too big of a character beat to just lay out in the trailer like that. Yeah. Especially as as far out from this movie as that trailer was. That was a couple months back. I would have been happy if they would have saved that for the movie. Yeah, yeah. it is another one of those unfortunate things where you you put all the trailer triggers together and you have a basic outline of the movie mm -hmm. um but i mean <sighs> i tried to just watch like one trailer i watch a teaser trailer now i watch like the main trailer but when you're sitting like in a theater and stuff they will show like you end up seeing multiple trailers of the same movie so it's kind of yeah. hard to avoid the thing is it's the only trailer for any of these marvel movies that i can think of that feels so like this is a major character beat, and you get the gist of this character beat in its entirety based on the trailer. Mm hmm This, me, me personally, I don't really care about spoilers. Have you both seen Logan? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Spoiler Someone warning for anyone who hasn't seen Logan and is watching this stream. Oh, boy. Yeah. Spoiler alert if you have not seen Logan, the X-Men film starring Hugh Jackman and Wolverine. Someone could have told me that Hugh Jackman dies before I'd seen it, and I wouldn't really care that much. I'm not a big spoiler guy. Like, spoilers don't really bother me. 
but I can stand, I can understand, but for the mass audience, then that's not really the case. Mm. So it, it is a fine line to walk when you're trying to market your film. Well, uh, okay. you know, give them, give people enough to where they understand the story, but not to where they feel like they've already seen said story. Yeah. And also give them enough to keep them interested and excited and want to see the movie. Like when you see the title card, boom, Spider-Man Homecoming, you're supposed to be excited and want to go out to see it. Yeah. But at the same time, not it's feeling like you've already seen it. Mm-hmm. People sort of treat it like the Batman v Superman second trailer, where it's like, okay, Batman and Superman are doing their thing, they meet each other, they disagree, they fight Doomsday, the end. I've seen the movie now. And now people sort of make the argument that, like, okay, Spider-Man's doing his thing, he wants to impress Iron Man, he screws up, gets the suit taken away, uses the homemade suit, beats the bad guy with the homemade suit, the end. And I will not be remotely surprised if it, if that's exactly how the movie turns out. What I'm curious is, do we think that Peter gets um, his upgraded suit back before or after the climax? I think after, most definitely. Especially if um, if Iron Man is not even involved in that in that playing sequence at all. Like the final climax, um, if Iron Man's not involved, I don't picture Sp- Spider-Man getting a suit back during or before that that scene. Yeah, I feel like there's two options. Either Peter does something to redeem himself to Tony, or maybe just steals the suit. (laughs) Like, okay, two two options. He tries to fight Vulture with the homemade suit and fails, and that's the plane sequence. And then goes, but then that would, hmm... Yeah, the only way that I can see this working out for Peter's character arc is if he fights Vulture with the homemade suit, wins, and then I guess gets the uh, the upgraded suit back at the end. And I only think he's going to get it back by the end because there's no way that they're going to have Spider-Man in Infinity War without the iconic Spider-Man suit. Yeah, yeah. for sure. He will get it back by the end of the movie. We all know that for sure. <laughs> yeah, but probably not by the climax. Which makes me wonder just how late into the movie the Staten Island thing happens. I would say that's probably, I mean, given um, the action scenes that we've seen and all like the basic plot that they've laid out for us, I would say that the Staten Island ferry fight is probably um, the last fight right before the climax. Like that fight happens, Iron Man is disappointed in him, he takes the suit away, and then the very the next action scene is the climax where he's fighting in the homemade suit. I hope if that that there's a lot of time between those two things. I feel like he's not gonna get the suit until the end. I don't know why, but I have that feeling. Yeah. Just because him getting it before he fights the vulture is gonna seem like betraying the Yeah, that wouldn't make sense. Like why would you not wear your upgraded suit if you have it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and what's the point of having him prove himself if he's still going to be relying on Stark Tech to get the job done? I have an, another question for you guys. Do you think, because this has been, like for hardcore fans, this has been a pretty strong debate um, through, since we've gotten the more recent trailers. How do you feel about Spider-Man's uh, costume being so decked out with all this technology? Like, he has his own Jarvis talking to him. Um, uh, Damien, a friend of mine who's a big Spider-Man fan, that's something that really turns him off. Um, I'm not a huge fan of that either. I don't hate it, but I, I definitely don't like it. I don't like that Spider-Man has this AI that he talks to. I don't like, like it, but I also don't remotely understand the complaint that some people have because they think that that AI is replacing the spider sense. Like, oh, no, I don't think it's replacing the spider sense. That that doesn't make any sense to me at all. I've heard people make that complaint, and I'm like, we see him use the spider sense in Civil War. Mm-hmm. Like, three times at least. Uh, I think it goes with, okay, I mean, Tony made the suit, so it goes with, you know. Plus, it's 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 a natural character thing on Tony's part. Yeah, after- okay after Rhodey got so badly injured and now he's working with this kid who also got hurt during that fight, of course he's going to give him as many 
like as Ned Leeds says, training wheels as possible because he doesn't want to get someone else hurt. Yeah. I think it goes with the story and everything. So I don't have a problem with it. Um, I don't I don't either as far as what the suit allows him to do. Um, it's just I don't know. Peter Parker, um, you can now do this and do that instead of like him just looking over Tony's like instructions and doing it that way as opposed to actually having an AI in a suit. That just strikes me as too we're taking yeah, too many ele- elements from Iron Man and giving it to Spider Man. That's yeah. just that to be fair, that is sort of a little bit of the problem of having teenage Peter Parker be best friends with Tony Stark mm-hmm. in the first place, is that now your best friend is billionaire Iron Man who can pull all these strings and get you all this stuff. It's gonna be kind of hard to have him be put upon struggling for cash at every opportune moment, Peter Parker. Which, I mean, it'll be fine for the purposes of this movie, but it'll be interesting to see how they handle that down the road. Because it's fair to say that the two of them are going to be on all right terms by the end of this movie. I don't think this is going to be another movie where Tony's, like, alienated everyone. And, like, the lesson for Peter at the end is going to be, oh, maybe I shouldn't listen to Tony at all. No, I think they will have like a father-son relationship still at the end of the movie. Mm. At the very least, friends. Um, I have a big question to ask you guys. Um, we know that this this movie is a big reaction to um, to both the previous franchise with Andrew Garfield and the franchise before that with Sam Raimi. Um, Marvel. You know, they avoided the origin story because they know that people hate that and they hate reboots and they hate, they just, they didn't want an origin story. That's, that's what people complained about. Everyone knows Spider-Man's origin story. Even if people didn't hate reboots, there's nothing to be gained by showing it again. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, well, that's fair enough. But, um, I just, my question to you guys is, do you think that there will be even a hint of that in this movie, and should there be? Mm. Like, just, what what happened to us, do you think maybe as far that as should come up in dialogue, maybe? Like, we just have, like, one one um, line about it. Like you maybe find some possible potential spoilers for, like, the first couple of minutes of this movie. Because we already know about the um, him filming himself during Civil War for, like, a vlog, which, if you if you put that next to the Civil War scene, doesn't actually make any sense. But just for the purposes of this movie, he's filming himself with Civil in in Civil War. Stuff I've heard about this movie makes me think that that's going to be the opening of the movie or near the very beginning and that like the whole beginning of the movie is going to be how we got from normal Peter Parker to where he is in this movie. So I think if we see any of the origin, it's going to be, we open with regular old Peter Parker. We skim over the origin. We skim over him being Spider-Man for a little while. We skim over his like civil war vlogs. And then five months later, start the actual story. I can see him doing that, but I personally don't think they're going to do any of that. People just are very sick of hearing the Spider-Man story at this point, so I think they're just going to leave that behind. Yeah, but at the same time, you you sort of got to look at it like the origin story of Peter Parker, how exactly Uncle Ben died is so important to who he is as a person that you sort of have to visualize it or at least describe it so that we know how it's informing his character. Like, they sort of did it in Civil War, which is why I think they could get away with not doing it. Like, we know how his origin affected him because of what he says in that movie. But I think there is... I think people would be justified in having a problem with it. But I think there is a decent story based excuse you could make for like no it's important enough to who peter parker is that you see how this happened yeah i'm actually curious how they're going to handle the uncle ben thing like are they 
going to do a flashback for it, or are they going to have Aunt May describe it? And I, I think they'll have Aunt May describe it. Yeah, I think I think they'll do that. For two re- oh, either Aunt May or Peter Parker, for two reasons. Number one, I think if they if they visualize it, they run the risk of um, maybe not, maybe alienating isn't the right word, but just ticking off people who really don't want to see anything that has to do with his origin after already seeing it twice. Mm-hmm. I think it, it's more palatable if you just have someone bring it up real quick and talk about it. Um, mm-hmm. Especially because, you know, Uncle Ben, you know, is dead. And so for me, at least, death has um, a more lasting impact if after a character dies, we never see them again. You don't constantly flash back to them, but they're mm-hmm. talked about. And so that death just has more meaning because they're gone. And all you can really do is talk about them and keep them in your memory. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's a 50-50 that we visualize it, but like 100% that Uncle Ben gets a mention. Yeah. Especially because they have yet to even announce Uncle Ben being cast. Yeah. We don't even know if he's in this movie. Mm. I, I don't think a secret like that could have been kept. Yeah. It's probably not. This marketing team. Yeah. And uh, I guess one other thing before we finally uh, move on to Ragnarok, which is, I guess, the big not story prediction. How much money do you guys think this is going to make? Like, of the three movies coming out this year, do you think this is going to make more than Guardians and Ragnarok, or which one of the three is going to make the most money? I don't. I it might touch Guardians numbers. I don't see. I don't see it beating Guardians two, which is, is that kind of. I don't know. That kind of disappoints me just saying that, but I don't see it making quite as much. I think it's going to make more money actually because there's a lot of Spider-Man fans. A lot of people wanted to see this in the Marvel Universe, so I think it has a good chance of beating Guardian. At least mm, uh, it also, well, Guardians, Guardians had a great first movie. Yeah. They were, they were um, selling. They were selling that movie really hard on Baby Groot, and pretty much everyone in the planet bought into that. Mm-hmm. Um, with Spider-Man, though, you have a beloved character who's also had um, three movies that have really divided and alienated fans. And um, you've had him recast twice. Granted, people love, most people love this new iteration, but you do have that negative baggage that comes with a lot of the previous Sony movies. And yeah. so it has, it has because of those strikes going against it, I kind of have a hard time um, definitively saying what it would make, and I'm not even entirely sure what it would make as much as the new Guardians film. Mm. I think it would do great for sure. It would definitely be, you know, a, a quote unquote hit. You know, I don't think there's there's any doubt in my mind about that. But I just I don't see it. Well, it might beat Guardians of the Galaxy's numbers. It might not. I don't know. Here's an interesting <laughs> thought: Does it make more or less than Wonder Woman? <sighs> um, I think. It makes less, mm. which I think it makes less because with Wonder Woman you have a per- this perfect storm of events. We have the first good, legitimately good female-led superhero movie. Um, for a character that, and you have wanted to have a movie for decades. Yeah, people have been wanting that for decades, and we finally got it. We've gotten a Spider-Man movie before, mm-hmm. four times, the five times. Yeah, five times, and not even all of them are good. And, you know, put a bad taste in people's mouths. So I don't think it's going to hit a 220 million opening weekend like Wonder Woman did. Mm. No, I don't think it's going to be Wonder Woman. We'll see, though. (laughs) We'll see. I mean, I would be shocked, surprised, and over the moon if that happened. (laughs) But for now, we can only speculate. Which so, we should um, do with Ragnarok. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah, I think um, if if you guys don't have any other thoughts, we can um, put this video to uh, to a close. Um, 
like just just for the Spider-Man one, and then then we can get into Ragnarok. Yeah. And Black Panther. Yeah. You guys good? Yep. All right, everyone. We are closing out for uh, the okay. Spider-Man Homecoming speculation video. This was Malik Myers, and Nick, Nicholas, and Lucy, and Lucy. All right, bye, guys.